Welcome to the Fitness Mindset Podcast. My name is Amanda Mikolev and I am the head coach and director for Divine Physiques Coaching here in Melbourne, Australia. This podcast is for anybody who is struggling to stick to their fitness journey and is searching for a far more practical set of tools and strategies on how to stay the course long term because most of you should all know by now that motivation is in fact nothing more than a temporary emotion. What you will learn from any of the guests on the show is that they have all battled with their own setbacks and have had to learn practical means on how to come out on top and succeed. I hope this podcast helps you along your own journey and I thank you for tuning in today. Guys, welcome back to episode number 12 of the Fitness Mindset Podcast. I'm joined once again with my coach, Jacob. Jacob, welcome. Thank you, Amanda. Thanks for having me. Cool. So for those of um, those of uh, those that are watching out there that don't know who you are, Jacob, just give everyone a quick introduction uh, about who you are. Yeah, so it's an honor to be on again, Amanda, and I'm a coach, uh, own a couple of facilities. Uh, I'm an athlete myself, competing powerlifting and physique sports, and that's primarily the demographic that I work with, uh, serious lifters looking to get stronger, get bigger, improve their body composition, take their training and nutrition to the next level. Um, pretty interested in the science of nutrition and training and how to adopt a quote unquote evidence-based uh, approach to my practice. Um, but I, I find that my role within the fitness industry uh, has evolved a little bit. And now I'm more so uh, interested in how we can best apply other science in the real world to help people get uh, sustainable and effective results essentially um, and that's a little bit about me mm, cool a very straightforward unpretentious um, intro so there you have it guys so Jacob is definitely has had a big influence in my life this whole year um, he really is very extremely knowledgeable. So hence why I've brought him on today. So what we're going to do is we're going to chat about the ketogenic diet. So there's a lot of information out there available on keto. Um, so just a full disclosure, Jacob and I are not registered dietitians. So if you are interested in starting the keto diet, make sure that you check with your diet, your doctor first. If you do have diabetes, hyperglycemia, which is low blood sugar. Um, or heart disease, and then best to consult a registered dietitian. So now that that's out of the way, um, Jacob, let's dissect the keto diet. So what is it? So yeah, firstly, I think uh, when we discuss nutrition, it's important to understand the principles uh, of nutrition, such as energy balance, so uh, calories in, calories out, um, understanding the, the different macronutrients uh, and their unique roles within the body and the properties that they uh, impart. Uh, also understanding the factors that go into our total daily energy expenditure, such as our resting metabolic rate, our non-exercise activity thermogenesis, our thermic effect of feeding, and obviously our physical activity. Um, and then understanding how it changes in either side of the calories in or calories out is going to alter our, our body mass. So when we consume calories, it's simply energy and that energy needs to go somewhere, can't be uh, created or destroyed. So this is the laws of thermodynamics. So once we consume calories, we need to do something with it. And if we consume excess calories, so more calories in our total daily energy expenditure, uh, we're simply going to store them as energy. And we can store them in a number of uh, different places, such as you know, in the liver, we can store glycogen, uh, we can store glycogen within the muscles, we can store uh, fat within the muscles, so intramuscular triglycerides, and we also store uh, fat within adipose tissue. So uh, when we talk about nutrition, it's really important to understand the big rocks. So that is calorie balance, understanding the, the role of protein. So protein is really important. Um, the role of carbohydrates, they're the primary energy source of the body, especially for high intensity anaerobic activities, such as uh, lifting weights, uh, sprinting and things like that. And then fats for nutrient absorption, as well as uh, hormonal health. Then we've got things like fiber, alcohol, and we can get into the discussion about processed, unprocessed foods, but predominantly you want a diet that consists of minimally, minimally processed foods, high in protein, uh, calorie controlled, a pretty even balance of macronutrients uh, to support your training needs and your preferences, and you need to be able to stick to that long term. Now, what the keto diet is, uh, it's simply manipulating some of these principles uh, to chase a few benefits um, 
you know, there's a lot of hype, hope, and uh, I guess excitement about the keto diet um, by uh, mostly zealots, so people who are on the bandwagon, so to speak. Um, but it's not necessarily magic. It's just manipulating these uh, these variables within our diet. And primarily, what uh, the ketogenic is doing, ketogenic diet rather, is doing is it includes uh, less protein than most high protein diets. So usually uh, 10 to 20% of total daily intake uh, is extremely low in carbohydrates. Uh, so the ketogenic meals within the diet shoot for nearly zero carbohydrates, um, you know, anywhere from 80 to 90% of um, total daily energy intake is going to come from uh, fat. Um, and yeah, so, so minimal carbs, lots of fat and a very modest amounts of uh, protein. So the issues with the ketogenic diet are that it's unsustainable, uh, primarily because it, it limits the amount of food that you can consume. Um, and typically what most people can eat on the ketogenic diet is you know, a handful of proteins, such as meat, poultry, fish, seafood, and eggs. Um, they've got a, lot, a wide variety in terms of the fat sources, so avocado, coconut, olive oils, nuts, nut butters, bacon, egg yolks, uh, cheese, all these sorts of things. Um, and then there's you know very small amount of carbohydrates, low carbohydrate vegetables. So you know your leafy greens, your cruciferous vegetables, all that kind of stuff. And then everything else outside of that, that's on the banned list. And this is what we would classify as rigid dietary restraint because it's a very dichotomous black and white uh, perception of food. Now, in the literature, dichotomous uh, type thinking has been uh, negatively associated with a number of physiological and psychological outcomes. So uh, weight rebound or yo-yo uh, dieting, uh, you know, mood disturbances, higher BMIs, uh, and a number of other things. So it's quite problematic to have a very rigid approach to dieting. And this is what the ketogenic diet does. It eliminates foods, puts them on the banned list, and then you've got a very small selection of foods uh, on the on the good list um, and, and viewing foods in such a binary manner. So good and bad, healthy, unhealthy, uh, can be really detrimental, uh, not just to your ability to sustain the diet, but more importantly, um, your well being, because it can cause a number of uh, issues related to your body image. Um, and most importantly, it's going to negatively impact your relationship with food, uh, which can lead to, you know, binge eating disorder, uh, you know, bulimia nervosa, all these sorts of things. So really important uh, when we discuss nutrition, we want to have a flexible uh, type of restraint. And this is where we have a more graded approach to nutrition. So there's no hard and fast food rules. Um, we have an inclusive diet. There's moderation. You know, if you have a big meal at lunch, you might have a smaller dinner. Um, because you're aware of uh, you know, the calorie content in foods and things like that, but you're not trying to eliminate foods. There's no dichotomous type thinking. And this has had positive associations with things like body mass index, um, you know, mood, uh, anxiety, depression, as well as uh, long it's been shown to improve long-term weight management. So very important that we adopt a flexible approach and the scientific literature supports this. There's quite a lot of research uh, you know, being conducted at the moment on the relationship between uh, different models of dietary restraints, so rigid and flexible, uh, and the literature is showing that a rigid diet is you know, really, really detrimental uh, to an individual's relationship with food and body. So for that reason, uh, because the keto diet is so restrictive, it's a rigid uh, model of restraint and therefore it's probably not going to help you because one of the fundamental questions I think we always need to ask ourselves when we're looking to follow any diet is can we follow this diet for a month most people say yeah sure three months or they start to you know have a little bit of doubt six months 12 months two years and if you can't confidently say that you'll never have a bowl of pasta again or go out for a big mac or have a beer um, because you want to follow this ketogenic diet then it's not going to be sustainable and it's more often than not going to solve more problems. Uh, sorry, it's going to create more problems than it solves. So I guess that's a little bit of a background on what the ketogenic diet is and nutrition in general, uh, as well as the different models of restraint, uh, because that's what we need to do. If we want to manage our weight, we need to have cognitive control over our food choices and, you know, rigid restraint, um, you know, has been shown to be not so uh, beneficial and, flexible restraint has been shown to be more beneficial. So I hope that uh, is a good segue into your next question, Amanda.
Cool. And guys, that can that basically finalizes the podcast. So <laughs> <laughs> that was good. That was good. Um, yeah, so look, I did a bit of research into Dom D'Agostino. Um, yes. Yeah, so for those of you who have no idea who he is, so he's a researcher based in America who um, basically has a website centered around the ketogenic diet, um, resources, foods, and stuff like that. So it's pretty much a one-stop shop for keto. Now, he discusses a lot of the benefits around um, keto and more of the cognitive and health benefits rather than just the diet itself. So, I mean, you did, you've already pointed out a lot of the sort of the negative effects of the keto, such as having to cut out food groups and eating out would be an issue as well, because, you know, a, a lot of things have carbs in them, unfortunately. So it's, it's almost impossible to cut out carbs from your lifestyle and, and still make it socially acceptable, I guess, would probably be one of the yeah, better ways oh. to term it. Um, have you, I mean, have you experienced... Have you ever tried keto yourself or have you ever recommended keto for any of your clients? Yeah, so I actually uh, tried keto a couple of years back, um, just a little bit of an experiment. I lasted about two weeks mm. <laughs> simply because, uh, yeah, it probably wasn't long enough to be, uh, you know, keto adapted. Um, but, but I just found it very unpleasurable um, and it, it got to a point where I just didn't want to eat any more fats. You know, I couldn't eat out with my family and friends. And I was just like, is this really worth it? Like what, what kind of magical benefits is this going to offer me? Um, that's worth giving up, you know, all these other important things in my life. Um, and I think when we, when we pursue anything in life, it's really important to, to run a cost uh, to benefit analysis. Uh, so, you know, weighing up the potential costs, uh, with the potential benefits uh, of, of a certain thing. You know, we do this in economics and finance, and I think we should uh, definitely employ uh, a similar line of thinking when it comes to nutrition. But unfortunately, many people don't. So uh, yeah, when it comes to the ketogenic diet, it's, well, the, the potential benefits are, okay, you might get some improved weight loss and fat loss. You might you know, be a little less hungry. You might have improvements in your, you know, performance. But then, what, what at what cost? Yeah, you're not allowed to eat out with your family anymore. It's very difficult, uh, you know, to navigate social settings. Uh, you've got this very small window of foods that you can now eat from. You know, I know they're making all these like uh, ketogenic bars and things like this, but they absolutely taste like crap. You know, food is a very important part of our culture and society uh, in general. And I think that, you know, it's something that we should enjoy. We shouldn't view food as something uh, inherently harmful. And again, this goes back to the rigid uh, dietary restraint. No food in isolation uh, is detrimental to our health or our well-being or our body composition. A diet as a whole uh, definitely can be for sure. Um, but one food in isolation isn't. And I think the same can be said for, uh, you know, macronutrients. You know, carbohydrates aren't inherently fattening or harmful to your health, uh, you know, nor is sugar. It's about how much you're consuming. It's all about the dose. So how much you're consuming uh, on a regular basis over a long period of time. And I think this is where people really zoom in to the, to the finer details uh, of nutrition and they miss the forest for the trees. So they get so caught up on that one tree that they forget there's a whole forest out there and you know, all these other things that they need to be thinking about. Um, when we zoom out a little bit, we can see that, okay, if we just look to the scientific literature, the, all of the research, so not just one study, look to the entire body of literature. You know, uh, that there's a meta-analysis that was conducted over 22 studies uh, that found uh, in protein and calorie equated uh, diets, there was no difference in weight loss between a low carb approach uh, versus a high carb approach. And, you know, yes, you can find studies where there's like, you know, it's shown that ketogenic diets are superior to, to higher carbohydrate diets for fat loss. Um, but that's just one study. We need to look to the entire body of literature. And again, the same can be applied when we look to our diets as individuals. Uh, you know, don't worry if you have one chocolate bar, worry if you're having a chocolate bar at every meal and you're doing that over 10 years, well, then you're potentially going to, run into some problems hmm. but if you're having one chocolate bar once a week or once a month that's not necessarily a bad thing um and yeah you mentioned dom digostino and look there's been a lot of uh you know purported benefits uh you know in the in the pathways and the the ketosis uh, mechanisms 
Uh, so basically, you know, the pathway to ketosis, just a bit of a background. Uh, when the conditions are right, for instance, during starvation or fasting or when our carb intake is really low, our body will release fatty acids from our stored body fat. Uh, these fats, uh, fatty acids enter other cells uh, and then they're combined with, you know, coenzyme A to form acetyl uh, choline chains. And these chains move into the mitochondria, which is uh, basically the fuel or the, uh, the workhouse of the, the muscle. And then these chains are broken down again, um, you know, through a sequence of reactions known as uh, better oxidation. Um, then this chemical magic uh, takes place. There's a number of other things that happen. Ketones are released into the liver and the blood. Um, and then almost any cell that needs energy can grab it from these circulated ketones. Um, and the brain is generally the, the muscle that will uh, take most of these uh, molecules, these ketone molecules. Mm. Um, but again, uh, you know, this is the minutia. This is, you know, really zooming, zooming right in. Um, but I would say that uh, for many people, if they're going to go on a cheated ketogenic diet, um, you know, they need to have uh, more ketone uh, bodies than normal. Um, you know, not to be confused with ketoacidosis, so which is potentially a dangerous metabolic situation of uncontrolled ketosis. Um, and our body's very good at self-regulating. So if it senses like acid levels rising, rising uh, as it happens in ketosis, it will respond by buffering more alkaline molecules, um, you know, changing blood, uh, you know, all the hydrogen ions and telling the kidneys to do more work, um, you know, to regulate this. Um, but again, if you're going to follow a ketogenic diet, you probably need to get some, some blood work done, um, you know, and regularly assess, you know, your, your ketone uh, levels and things like that. Um, because if you're not, how do you know you're even in ketosis? Hmm. And that's assuming that you're actually following a ketogenic diet and not, uh, you know, binging on carbohydrates or cheating on the diet uh, and all these kind of things. So again, I think, um, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, weight loss, um, you know, ketone uh, supplementation or ketogenic diets isn't really going to do much um, in terms of blood glucose regulation. Um, you know, there's, there's not a lot of benefits there, but, you know, the, the benefits are more in uh, these extreme cases, you know, if individuals have, um, you know, traumatic brain injuries or epilepsy, um, you know, even cancer, there's, there was a big uh, meta-analysis, uh, I believe, I think it was a meta-analysis, um, I'm just trying to remember this off the top of my head. Um, there was a big meta-analysis um, which found that in adult patients, uh, you know, ketogenic diets um, isn't going to uh, be a universal solution to cancer. Um, so again, you know, the, the benefits of ketogenic diets are still in question. They're not even, um, you know, confirmed. It's just one of these things that seems to happen every, you know, five to 10 years. Um, a new diet comes out, people do a few studies and, you know, there's a few potential benefits or theoretical mechanisms behind it and everybody jumps at it, but nobody really stops to think, well, um, you know, if this was the case, why aren't we all doing this already? And, you know, why aren't we all uh, healthy in shape and, you know, kicking ass, uh, you know, our fitness goals. Um, but yes, I do think uh, ketogenic diet may work for some people. Again, if you can follow it and you can adhere to it, then it's not a problem. But if you're somebody who, uh, you know, likes carbohydrates, you play, you compete or engage in high intensity activity, uh, you have a social life and, you know, you're probably going to, be better off with a more balanced approach to your diet, you know, potentially a low carb diet, but I don't think you necessarily need to go ketogenic. Mm, okay, cool. So do you think um, the keto diet has positive or negative effects on strength gains or does it really boil down to overall body weight or muscle mass overall? Yes, yeah, so that's a good question. And I think um, in terms of uh, strength development, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we know that carbohydrates are a primary uh, energy source and especially for high intensity uh, exercise such as lifting weights um, and carbohydrates uh, play a key role in a number of uh, anabolic pathways um, you know due to their role in uh, stimulating insulin and all these sorts of things um, and when we have a, a full glycogen stores within the muscle um, obviously that's going to allow for you know better muscular contraction all these sorts of things um, so it's really important uh, from a training point of view um, for strength athletes or anyone looking to build muscle carbohydrates are essential um, 
but they're not an essential nutrient, but they are conditionally essential. Um, and you know, if you're doing lower intensity exercise, you're probably not uh, as much reliant uh, on carbohydrates as you would be on fats. Um, but yeah, again, um, you know, ketosis, um, you know, might let you avoid uh, glycogen depletion. Um, because you aren't using glycogen as your energy source, so you don't need to take in carbs. Uh, you know when you're when you're training, uh, because you're using fat and ketones. Um, but this all sounds great, but the the consensus is that whilst these adaptations are true, um, you know fat and ketone bodies as fuel, uh, they're not going to allow you to go as fast or train as hard as what you would be able to. You know when using glucose and carbohydrates. So if mm. performance is your goal. Um, you know, you probably want to be consuming a moderate to high carbohydrate diet. So, okay. So then, cause I mean, you've already answered so many questions as I've gone down my list as well. So, um, so just to recap quickly that for people that are powerlifting or bodybuilding, carbohydrates mm -hmm. is definitely the needs to be a priority in, in a person's diet. Um, ketones seem like to be more of an economical choice of energy source over carbohydrates. So let's be a bit specific then. If people are doing any form of sport, um, what sort of sports would be more suitable for uh, the ketogenic way? Yeah, look, to be honest, I'm uh, not um, too well versed with the literature um, on uh, you know, other sports outside of uh, strength training and, and building muscle and strength. Um, because that's, that's my area. But, uh, from what I do know, I think, uh, endurance sports or anything that uh, doesn't require, uh, you know, a high degree of work output in a short period of time. Uh, so, you know, marathons, long distance running, um, you know, all these sorts of things, um, you know, might, uh, be better suited to a higher fat diet, um, you know, potentially, you know, ketogenic diet. Um, but again, I wouldn't be too comfortable giving, uh, any specific recommendations there. Yeah, cool. And that just comes back to um, ATP. So explain a little bit around a ATP, what it is and how it works in anaerobic exercise um, and why carbohydrates is probably the preferred fuel source in that aspect. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So uh, ATP is adenosine triphosphate, so it's a complex organic chemical, uh, basically provides energy to drive the main processes uh, you know, in, in our cells, uh, such as the muscles, uh, nerve impulse, and chemical synthesis. So um, basically ATP is found in like all forms of life, um, and it's often referred to as uh, the molecular unit of currency. So uh, it is responsible for intracellular energy transfer. So uh, you know, in metabolic processes, uh, it converts adenosine triphosphate, so uh, ADP, um, to adenosine monophosphate. Um, and then other processes regenerate ATP. So the human body recycles its own body weight equivalent in that ATP per day. Um, and then we use that energy to support uh, muscular contraction, um, you know, through what's called the sliding filament theory. So basically uh, we have, uh, you know, myosin and actin. Uh, it's like sardines in a can within our muscles and they go together and they slide away from each other. So they stretch and they shorten, um, you know, ATP fuels that process and that, that lengthening and shortening is what, uh, you know, moves the bones. And then that's obviously how we contract muscles um, to overcome resistance, which would be, you know, your dumbbells, your barbells and things like that. So, cool. so yeah, a ATP really important uh, when you, when you're in the gym training uh, because it is that, uh, you know, that unit of, uh, currency for energy transfer. So we're transferring energy from the body to the muscles so they can produce mechanical work. Cool. All right. Now, um, I recently read in a study that um, there was men, uh, men who perform resistant training for eight weeks. And the conclusion was such that the subjects were able to drop body fat, maintain lean mass, um, but that keto was not going to necessarily be suitable for people wanting to essentially increase muscle mass or bulk for all the meatheads out there. What's your understanding of this? Yeah, so I'm not 100% uh, up to date on uh, that specific uh, study. But in terms of losing fat and building muscle uh, simultaneously, um, 
you know, I think back to what I was saying uh, in regards to, to gaining lean mass, um, you know, insulin, the storage hormone uh, is, is a very anabolic or anti-catabolic hormone uh, as in it helps us build things and get pretty jacked. Uh, so for the most part, we need insulin uh, along with other hormones such as growth hormone, testosterone to create anabolic uh, or, or, you know, muscle building environment. So trying to build muscle while in ketosis, uh, you know, is, is pretty difficult. Uh, it's basically like, uh, you know, you're running a race, but you stop all the time because it, it's not worth it anymore. Um, it, it just doesn't make a hell of a lot of sense. So when our goal is to build muscle, um, you know, we need to have some carbohydrates to fuel, uh, you know, uh, our performance in the gym. Now, in terms of that specific study, an eight week study, really short, uh, you know, I, I can't confirm whether the participants were trained or untrained, but given that they gained muscle and lost fat at the same time, so body recomposition, I would almost argue that they were novices. So that's with minimal training experience, um, therefore meaning that they're going to grow just simply looking at weights for the most part because they have the greatest amount of growth potential because uh, everything's a novel stimulus and they haven't uh, reached their genetic uh, limit yet in terms of uh, their muscular development. So I think, yeah, when you look at these kind of studies and it has a, a solution or the conclusion is supporting a specific diet, it's really important to, to pick that study apart and to, to look at some of the variables in the study and you know, how the study was put together, um, you know, if there was any funding or you know, sponsoring of the study, uh, you know, the status of the participants, so whether they were trained, untrained, male or female, if this study was on males, well, that means it applies to a very, you know, half of the, the population, um, as opposed to if it was both males and females, we could draw uh, considerable uh, conclusions that, it, you know, might work for everyone. Also looking to the sample size. So, you know, in most training studies, we don't have large samples just because it's uh, not very logistical um, or it creates too many logistic issues. Um, so you're probably looking at, you know, say 10 to 20 people, um, you know, and from that we can only draw averages. So this might work for the average person. They're always going to be outliers. So there might be some people who, you know, lost a lot of fat and built a lot of muscle. There might be someone who actually gained fat and lost muscle on this study. So, you know, the conclusion is always based on averages, um, you know, and we need to also, you know, look to the statistical significance. So that is the, the power of the study. Um, and, you know, depending on you know, the type of analysis that was conducted in terms of the research, um, you know, it, it may not be statistically significant enough uh, to draw solid conclusions that we would apply uh, blanketly across the board. So, yeah, I can't say that I've read that specific study, but I hope that just helps you understand, you know, maybe why these outcomes came to be. Yeah, cool, cool. Um, now, do you know, so you did mention earlier as well that... Um, Keto diet can produce a higher acid profile within a person. So could this result in too much acidic buildup and potentially cause kidney stones? Yeah, again, I'm not too familiar with, uh, you know, this, this exact body of research. But uh, like I said, the body is very, very good at regulating itself. Um, you know, the primary goal of the human body is to preserve homeostasis. So for those of you who don't know, a homeostasis is basically your body's happy land uh, where everything works uh, and is in, you know, quote unquote balance, much like a thermostat uh, on your conditioner or your heater, you set the temperature and uh, you know, if the temperature goes above what you set it for, uh, the air conditioner will come on to bring things down. When uh, you know, the temperature drops too low, the heater will come on to bring the temperature back up. This is very much how the body works. So when we have, you know, a buildup in anything, um, you know, beyond our baseline levels or what's within our homeostatic range, um, you know, the body will upregulate or downregulate uh, certain systems uh, to make sure that it's in balance. Um, and this is uh, called, uh, you know, feedback loops. So we have negative and positive feedback loops. So uh, positive feedback loops, uh, there's not many of them. That's when we start to see continuous uh, production based on an external stimuli. So for example, if we drink water, uh, we'll continue to urinate, that's a positive feedback loop. Um, however, resistance training is a negative feedback loop. So the more we do resistance training, uh, the less uh, you know, anabolic signaling we produce over time because uh, we build up a, a tolerance to that um, and building muscle is uh, pretty much counterintuitive to our evolutionary purpose. So, um, you know, when we have these things like, you know, build up of acids or things like that, um, you know, unless 
done you know in the extremes so you know in super uh you know super physiological doses uh you know in a very acute time frame so over a short period of time um so the body doesn't have time to regulate itself um yes you could potentially you know develop something like kidney stones and things like that uh, but for the most part i think uh you know those kind of things are pretty hard to do you have to be pretty uh sh silly with what your uh, approach is uh you know t to get something as serious as that yeah okay cool um would you know of any other sort of scenarios where you think the keto diet may not work for someone yeah if you like carbs <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't if, work if for like me or you, if you, maybe. If, if you're if you're European, uh, you have a nonna, and <laughs> yeah. or you have or you have a, a girlfriend who's uh, you know Italian, Greek, Lebanese, or anything like that. You do <laughs> you get the ketogenic diet. Uh, I think the ketogenic diet will work really, really well. Um, you know, if you're put on the North Pole, um, mm. you know, and all you could eat was fish, that'd be great because yep. that's what we have access to. Um, but I think in most Western cultures, the, the fact that we have so much food available, um, you know, our social life, uh, you know, is very much centered around, you know, carbohydrate or at least mixed meal uh, consumption. It just doesn't make a hell of a lot of sense um, from a sustainability standpoint. And the best diet is the one you can sustain uh, for the longest period of time. Um, yeah. And that, you know, makes you feel good day to day. Mm. And I think feeling good is not something that we should chase, you know, when we eat. Um, it should be this, this thing we monitor um, you know, during a meal or before a meal, during a meal, after a meal, uh, you know, the periods between your meals, uh, which is uh, what's called the postprandial phase. So how much energy uh, a meal gives you, how full it makes you feel, um, you know, whether it sets off any triggers to go consume other foods. Um, and for sure, carbohydrates can do that, but so can fats. And when carbohydrates and fats uh, and sugar and salt are combined, it's what's called hyperpalatable. And this is when we can start to overconsume foods. Uh, so I think, you know, it's not necessarily carbohydrates in isolation because, uh, in fact, potatoes, white potatoes are one of the most satiating uh, food sources, actually in the top eight uh, satiating food sources as found by the American uh, Journal of Nutrition in a 2008 study, um, you know, that we can have. And satiation is largely uh, important for people who have weight uh, loss related goals. Mm. Uh, so it's not necessarily that the carbohydrates are to blame. Uh, like I said earlier, we can't, you know, single out one uh, specific macronutrient or food group or, or food source and say this is the cause of obesity and weight gain this is why we can't lose weight uh, it's more so uh, what we're doing to these foods and how we're combining them to make them hyper palatable uh, extremely cheap easily to easy to access uh, available 24 7 these are the problems that people really need to be addressing uh not necessarily uh yeah picking out and blaming uh you know one food or food group yeah, yeah, definitely. It's all about balance at the end of the day. And um, I think everyone is searching for that one one trick pony or that real sort of, yeah, that magic pill, which just really doesn't exist, unfortunately. So it's just about striking balance. I wish it balance. did because I'd be, yeah. I'd be on it. Definitely, definitely. All right, I think what we'll do is we'll go into a little bit of Q&A now. Um, cool. you, you have pretty much answered everything, but um what something that robert asked benefits and precautions of maintaining ketosis long term is it possible to maintain it long term and the side effects of cutting out one of the macronutrients yeah i think i, I covered that um i don't think you could sustain it long term mm -hmm. uh, in fact i'm pretty sure most people won't be able to sustain it long term um and yeah i just think that uh in order to sustain it, it's going to be um, quite the uphill battle for many people. Um, but whether or not it's potentially harmful, I'm not sure. I don't mm. think many ketogenic uh, studies have lasted, uh, you know, more than a couple of months. Um, and I would say that that's simply because people can't sustain it. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Cool. Um, Sam asks, is it safe without a gallbladder? And if you have poor liver function? I'm, I'm no not a that. doctor and, and yep. I can't uh, give advice on that one, unfortunately. Uh, and yeah. I think this is important because, uh, you know, it's, it's good to know what kind of questions you want answered. But then I think what's even more important is knowing where to ask these questions. Um, you know, because when we know where to ask the questions, uh, we're going to get a better answer. Number one, we're going to save a lot of time uh, and we're going to be able to, you know, help ourselves a lot more efficiently. So I think, you know, if you have anything medically related, uh, 
you know, in terms of like kidney stones, gallbladder, liver, all these kind of things. Don't ask a personal trainer. Mm. Don't even ask a nutritionist. You potentially ask a dietitian. Don't ask a psychologist. They know about the brain. They don't know about your fucking liver. Go ask a doctor. Go seek professional advice from somebody who's spent, uh, you know, years looking into these things. And again, yeah. um, you know, I'm no different. You know, this whole ketogenic uh, diet discussion, uh, I'm not an expert, but, you know, I've worked with a lot of people and, you know, read enough about it that I, you know, I think I can uh, assess, uh, you know, how it fits in, uh, you know, to, to building muscle and losing fat and, you know, whether it's something that I would advocate. Um, and I can give my opinion on that. But if you want an expert's opinion, um, you, know, you should probably look to somebody who's been researching, not just ketogenic diets, but nutrition at large. Uh, because, yeah. you know, if we find that somebody's been focusing on ketogenic diets their whole life, they might have potential biases because their career is dependent on, you know, the, uh, the efficacy of a ketogenic diet. So they're going to only, you know, look to positive conclusions, uh, you know, not null findings. So not finding any, any purported benefits. So, so yeah, sorry, I couldn't answer your question, Sam, but uh, I hope that gives you some food for thought. Mm. And Tess asks, weight gain after stopping? slash being on a less strict keto diet? So, uh, yeah, I think, uh, firstly, there's no such thing as a less strict ketogenic diet. You're either in ketosis or you're not, um, which is basically why it's not sustainable because most people, they'll have some carbs here and there. It's like, well, you're not doing ketogenic diet. You're just doing low carb now. Um, and I think giving a name to any form of diet is, is yeah, harmful to, to many people. Um, and evident that they have a very rigid uh, mindset towards their diet. So yep. I think, uh, yeah, the best way to go about that one is just offer a lower carb diet and then you know, potentially once or twice a week, increase your calorie intake and your carbohydrate intake just a little bit to maintenance calories this is what we would call a refeed. Have one or two refeeds each week, but then you've still spent five days, you know, a calorie deficit, losing weight, and then you've maintained weight for two days on the weekend. You just have a slower rate of loss um, instead of, you know, potentially binging on carbs because you've been restricting. And we can see that whole, you know, binge purge cycle, uh, and, you know, the yo-yo dieting, uh, that can be quite a hard uh, cycle to break out of. Mm. Okay. What about, um, have you seen a lot of coaches within the industry who prep um, people for competing? And I mean, I've seen it in the past myself where people like the coaches have put them on a keto crash diet for 12, 16 weeks just for the actual yeah. prep. Have you seen a lot of that within the bodybuilding community? Yes, I have. Um, Where, where's I think, their qualifications in being able to write these diets for their clients? How ethical is that? Yeah, I think, I think it's a very, very fine line, uh, you know, that we're talking about now because contest prep coaches usually don't have any formal nutrition qualifications. Uh, there's no... Uh, you know, qualifications for physique competitors, like, you know, in other sports, we have a, a governing body that provides certification um, to allow us to, you know, coach these people. Uh, but bodybuilding is this, this thing that just doesn't have any uh, real regulation. So it's a little bit tricky in that sense, mm. uh, which, which means that, um, you know, the coach is almost free to do whatever they want with their clients, um, yeah. which is quite scary. So, mm. um JPS will be releasing a physique contest prep course. Uh, you know, we've got our two-day course at the moment. We will be releasing an online course next year where we're going to actually uh, aim to teach coaches how to set up and execute a contest prep um, you know, with a very evidence-informed uh, approach and as healthy an approach as possible. And I would dare yep. say, uh, you know, a ketogenic diet for a contest prep is going to lead to some muscle loss. Um, yeah. And you're not going to look your best on stage because carbohydrates are very important for filling up muscle glycogen and giving you that, you know, uh, full look mm -hmm. uh, where your muscles are popping and bursting out of the skin on stage. Yeah. Um, and you're just not going to get that out of fats. Um, so yeah, in that sense, carbohydrates are you know, fundamentally important for a contest prep athlete. Cool. All right. Um, I think that pretty much answers everything today. So, um, do you have any cheeky plugs that you want to mention? Any courses coming up with JPS? I've got heaps, but, uh, but I'm yeah. not going to plug them. If people want to check them out, uh, yeah, we've got a mentorship course for personal trainers, a um, number of other courses, workshops. If they want to check them out, you can come have a look at our website. Um, but no, thank you for having me on, man. I really appreciate uh, you giving me a platform to, to talk about what I love. 
You're very welcome as always. But um, yeah, guys, thanks once again for watching and stay tuned for the next episode. Thank you so much for tuning into today's episode. If you liked the content, please make sure you support the show by giving us a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button and turn on post notifications so you are the first to know when a new show is being released. I am trying to get up a new show every single week as I'll continue to bring on interesting guests within the fitness industry who can only bring a lot of value to our listeners. If you're wanting to learn more about coaching with myself, please visit my website at divinephysiquescoaching.com. Thank you once again, and we will catch you on the next episode.